Well, we are going to finish up the last sermon of our series going through the life of Samuel. This is not the last story by any means of his life, but we covered a very unique pattern in his life. Normally, when you cover someone's life, you cover how they lived. But last week, we were, yeah, last week we were able to cover, two weeks ago, we were able to cover what he did after he died, which is actually kind of unique. He came back and spoke to Saul, which you don't normally get the chance to do that, <laughs> but we did. Today, though, we're going to cover our last story of his life. It's going to be in 1 Samuel, and we're going to be in chapter 16, chapter 16. We've been trying to pull out from Samuel's life what a godly person would look like. How, how did Samuel's life live as an example for us? We talked about his prayer life and we talked about his faith. We talked that he pushed through, that he endured. This morning, God gives Samuel x-ray vision. <laughs> I would love some x-ray vision. Boy, you know what kind of doctor I could be if I had x-ray vision? Still wouldn't be a good one. (laughs) I'd love to try it all. We're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 16, now verse 1. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil, And go, I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. Who provided Israel's king? This one. God did. He said, I'm the one providing this one. Now, why did he say that? (laughs) Because it's in direct contrast to the last king they had. They were the ones that wanted the king the first time. But this time, God wants them to have a king. If you want to picture it in your mind, this is not literal, but if you want to picture it in your mind, God has had it planned that Israel would have a king for centuries. Since they were in the wilderness, wandering. And God has been scanning the generations, looking for a certain type of man to lead the country. And now he's found it. Now we know that God is, <laughs> he's got everything in control. So don't think that, oh, well, I finally found one. That's not what I'm trying to say. But of all of the generations and of all of the people of Israel since the time of the wilderness, coming now into the nation, God has found his man. God has anointed his man. Verse 2, and Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And that was not beyond Saul's reach. Uh, He killed a whole group of priests, if you knew his story. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to, to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I name to you. So Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Do you come peaceably? I love it. (laughs) The Bible's just so real. You see the prophet Samuel showing up, and he's not normally coming to a little town like Bethlehem. He would go to other places, maybe where the king's at, but he shows up. It's kind of like the police showing up at your door unannounced. Uh... Everything all right, officer? (laughs) Samuel, um, what happened? What's so bad that you have now graced us with your presence? (laughs) Right? He said, well, I've come peaceably, verse 5. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then consecrate, then he, excuse me, consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. The word consecrated or sanctify there is kadash. And it means to set apart, to clean yourself up. What Samuel literally told them was, we're going to, we're going to worship the Lord together. For you to be able to do that town of Bethlehem, everybody go wash up and get clean. And we're going to worship before the Lord. 
We're going to have a sacrifice, and then we're going to have a feast. We're going to have a great time. But you need to clean yourselves up first. But notice the end of that verse. He tells everybody, he says, I've come peaceably to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves. You go wash up. You go set yourself apart. You're going to be clean. But then look what he does at the end. Then he consecrated, and it's the same word, Jesse and his sons. That's unique. He tells everybody else, you all go clean up and set yourselves off to the side. Jesse, you come here and you bring your sons with you. <laughs> because I'm going to clean you up and I'm going to set you aside. Now you can, you can picture it. The entire town is there for a massive meal. They're all going to celebrate. They're all going to have this fantastic feast. Okay, And then all of a sudden, Samuel says, all right, boys, bring Jesse and his sons in. And one by one, they start coming in front of the entire city, or the entire town, I should say. All right, that's the picture you should have in your mind. Verse 6. And so it was when they came that he looked, Samuel looked at Eliab and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Man, he looks like a king. He's, he's ripped in all the right places. He's handsome. He's strong. He's a warrior. He's going to be the one. Verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I've refused him. For the Lord does not see man see as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. <clears throat> Samuel was surprised when God said, nope, it's not a lie. Because Samuel had the same mental image of a king that all of the rest of Israel had. They wanted Saul, the guy that was head and shoulders above everybody else in the nation. They wanted the warrior. They wanted the guy that they thought could fix things. They wanted to see something that looked like a king of the rest of the nations. Samuel did too. But God says, you're looking at the wrong thing, Samuel. Let me give you an education, Samuel. <laughs> because what you're looking at is not what I'm looking at. And it's a good thing. Because we come to the next chapter and we find out all of these brothers that we're about to read... They were hiding in the tents with Saul when, came, when Goliath came calling. The only one that was willing to leave the tents was David. God saw that ahead of time because he saw something. He was looking for something different than what Samuel and Israel were. Verse 8. Or excuse me. Samuel should have... I missed this in my notes. Samuel should have remembered this. That God was looking at the heart from the bottom of verse 7? Because Samuel actually already prophesied this over Saul. Let's go to that. It's 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 13 and 14. This is Samuel prophesying to Saul after Saul has usurped his authority and did the sacrifice without him. Then Samuel told Saul, you have acted foolishly. You haven't obeyed the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom won't be established. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has appointed him as commander-in-chief over his people because you didn't obey that which the Lord had commanded you. God spoke through Samuel and told Saul what, Samuel, what God was looking for in a king. He said he's trying to find someone that has his heart. Saul didn't have God's heart. There was nobody else in Israel that had a heart like God, except for one man. And that's the one that the Lord appointed for himself. So now let's go to verse 8. So Jesse called Aminadab. And made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by. 
and said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. I have the poor mental image in my mind of the imagination, you know. Samuel is sitting here at the main table as all of these. Jesse comes by and Jesse's all proud. He sits next to Samuel in the place of honor. And he says, all right, boys, come on. And here comes Eliab. Man, Jesse's all proud. Got his chest puffed out. Boy, I'm proud of him. He's the biggest and the tallest. Samuel looks at him and says, no, that's not the one. Well, I'll send out a minute dad. So here comes a minute dad. He's a little bit shorter, a little bit, you know, not quite as stocky. No, it's not him either. I can picture in my mind Jesse's getting a little worried. Well, there went the first two. It only goes downhill from here, fellas. Well, send out Shema. Here comes Shema. Oh, that's not him either. I'm running out of fellas. All right, guys, come on. <laughs> and he sends all seven of his son, sons through, and the entire time Samuel's saying, Nope, that ain't him. Nope, that's not him. Nope, that's not him. <laughs> seven sons. By the way, is that number important in the Bible? You find it all over the Bible. What does it usually mean? Completeness. Seven throughout the Bible, you usually find it. It means completeness. The idea here is Jesse sent all of his sons. He thought it was done. This is all I got. Think about that. That's all that Jesse thought he had. Verse 11. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your young men here? Is that all you got? <laughs> God's rejected them all. Samuel knew. God says, I want you to pick out Jesse, and I want you to pick out one of his sons. Well, then God, as all of them come through, Samuel knew something was up. God told me this. <laughs> I'm obeying it, and it's not working out. Something's wrong. Jesse, is this all your sons? <clears throat> so then Jesse says, well, there remains yet the youngest. And there he is. He's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send him and bring him. For we will not sit down until he comes here. Now again, picture in your mind. <laughs> Here's the head of the table. The rest of the town's out here. You've got Samuel, you got Eliab, and you got him just down the row, all through the seven, and they're all standing there waiting for the king. Now, they don't know it's going to be the king, but they're all standing there waiting. Samuel says, Boy, boys, we're not going to start eating until we get him here. I'm sure at this point they had to rush. But think about it. What did Samuel tell them to do first? We're going to have a sacrifice. We're going to have a feast. Sanctify yourselves. David was out with the sheep. That's a stinky job. That's a nasty job. David had to come in. He had to wash up and put on his best garb. This was time consuming. Can you imagine? Picture it in your mind. Everybody's kind of like what you're doing now as I preach, right? <laughs> By the way, I'm just going to warn you. You know, this whole last week, I've had free reign to preach. And when you're preaching a revival, you don't preach 30-minute sermons. You preach an hour. So I'm just going to warn you. That's what I'm used to. No, David, it takes him some time to before he gets washed up and gets in here and gets cleaned and everybody's ready to go. And you see David coming. And he walks by Samuel. He walks by his father, Jesse. He walks by a lion. He walks by Shimei. He walks by a Minadab, all through his brothers. <laughs> and everybody's. <laughs> this guy? This kid? We're waiting for him. <laughs> He's just a little kid. He's not, there's nothing to him. Look at these guys. Samuel, do you not? I mean, him? <clears throat> Verse 12, so he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, and I'll be honest, that word, I have looked up, and everybody disagrees with what that word means, so good luck with it. 
Some say he had red hair. Some say say that he had uh, a dark complexion. Who knows? But he was ruddy, whatever that means, with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord says, arise and anoint him, for this is the one. (laughs) Of all of them that he picked, he picked the run of the litter. (laughs) Now, I want you to think about it really quickly. What number is David in the family of men? Eight. What does eight mean in the Bible? It's along that line. It's renewal. There's seven days in the week. The first day of the next week is the one that's blessed. Number eight is also what day of the week for Passover? That's the day that Jesus raised from the dead. It was a new beginning. It's a new power. Jesus is literally being incorporated in this. And there's a whole list of eight things uh, of what eight means throughout the Bible. It's incredible. All of this is brand new. And David, he's a man after God's heart. He's number eight. It's cool. You should look it up. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and he anointed him in the midst of his brothers and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David. From that day forward, so Samuel arose and went to Ramah, but here's the point I'm trying to make. Oh, come on. Nah, I bet he's dead as a doornail. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. You know, when the Spirit of God leaves, guess what enters? And a distressing or an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him from that day on. Uh, Just going to give you something. This is a rabbit trail. It's very short. It's very important. And I need you to get it for your life. If you decide to walk away from the Lord, if you decide to start walking out into sin and his spirit leaves and is quiet, You know what enters? Distressing evil spirits and they will destroy you. That's what happened to Saul. Well, for the rest of this sermon, I want to just kind of simply apply it. This is not a deep sermon. It's not intended to be. What do you do when choosing the most qualified candidates on resumes? What do you look for? Do you look for the best looking? Do you look for the strongest or the smartest? Do you look with the ones with the most experience? Well, we do. The pay raise goes up and down depending on how many years you've done it. Depending on the letters in front of your name. Right? I mean, you want to hire the the fastest working worker you can find. You want to hire the best organizer you can for your office. That's who you hire. Is that effective? Not necessarily. God passes over people all the time in favor of those whose heart's in the right place. You see, you can buy, you can hire the most talented human being on the planet. But if his heart's not in the right place, he isn't going to be worth a plug nickel to you. You can have the best looking person in the world hired to be your secretary sitting right in front of the desk so when people come in as visitors, they get to see her. The problem is, guess what? She's going to age over time. Thanks, Jay. I'll be a little louder now. See if that makes a difference. Hey, there it goes. I thought I had one bar before it began, but that one bar didn't last long. You can can hire the best looking person in the world, but guess what? Over time, they're going to age. Beauty fades, right? Experience is great. Looks are great. Smarts are great. But if their heart's not in it, you're wasting your money and your time. This last week, uh, after the revival on Friday night, I'm driving back from Mount Carmel and I stop in Canton to get an ice cream and get a meal because I hadn't eaten. 
And I, I decided there was a big line in the drive through so I decided to go in. And I go in, and it's like, I don't know, 10.30 at night. Well, maybe not, maybe 10.15 at night. By the time I left, it was like 10.45. Um, the guy that took my order, in the middle of my order, he uh, gets a phone call. And it turns out it was some of his friends that were getting ready to have a party after work. And they closed at 11, so it was coming up kind of quick, and they were trying to organize it. Well, I was trying to give my order. I'm a ways from home. I want to get home. I want to eat. I just want to leave. I, I'm not sure it's a good possibility he was high while he was here, <laughs> but he didn't listen well. He didn't get my order right. At one point, the lady that did the drive through window had to come over and finish my order for me, taking it so that I could get it. I finally get my order, and he doesn't even give me a cup to drink. I'm standing there looking like an idiot, and he's looking at me like, why are you still standing there? And I said, can I at least get my drink? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. His heart wasn't in it. He, I could have taken my order better than that, but I didn't. I could have done it, and I wasn't even getting paid for it. You can hire the most qualified, the best person ever, but if their heart's not in it, you're just wasting your time. God passes up people all the time because their heart's not in the right place. God wants passionate hearts to know Him and to serve Him. I'll be honest. When we're doing the hiring, sometimes it's kind of hard to see what the heart of the person really is. People are pretty good at putting on masks. They're really good about hiding behind their long list on their resume. I've seen some pretty phony resumes in my time. <laughs> you said you could do that. We said we'd pay you this much because you could. I remember I hired a guy for a job down in uh, Knoxville. I was doing a roof for a friend of mine. And I hired this guy and he said, yes, I've done a lot of roofing in my time. He just didn't happen to mention that in that amount of time that he had done that roofing for years, he was scared of heights and didn't want to get on the roof. Something didn't add up day one, you know what I mean? And then he said, well, I can do good cleanup since I can't get on the roof. Okay, that's fine. So clean up the roof, get it done. I mean, not the roof, excuse me. Clean up the ground, get it done. I want it spotless, no nails, don't want any punctures in the parking lot or in the grass. Okay. And he'd work for about five minutes and then he'd take a smoke break for 15. He wasn't really worth my time. And then what was funny about it all um, he talked a good game when I hired him. And then when he went to quit, hey, if you got any more roof jobs, you know, you, you got my number. Not for long, I don't. <laughs> Guess what? I still don't have his number. I don't know what I did with it, but I'm pretty sure I lost it. I'm not hiring him back. People can put on a resume and they can lie all they want, but it's only for a short time. Because as best you can hide behind any mask you build, guess what? At some point, your eyes are going to shine through. You can't hide forever. I know of a couple right now. And if you look at them from the surface, I'm not going to name any names because I'm pretty sure there's people in the church right now that know who I'm talking about, who I would say if I mentioned the name. You look at them from the outside and they look all nice and holy and Oh man, they're just, they're godly people, saints. Until you get to know who they really are. And I remember at one time there, there was, I didn't know about anything. All I, I just met them a few times and I knew that there was something, it just seems a little off. I'm not much for discernment, but, you know, looking at the mask, the mask looks okay, but you, there's just something a little different. I don't, I can't quite put my finger on it. And then I was visiting and around and saw something take place that just kind of solidified that just a little bit better. You know, it wasn't overtly bad, but it makes me wonder just a little bit more. You know what I mean? You ever been there? And then I got 
a chance to see behind the curtain. And the people should be in jail. Literally. If they came into the, our church service, you wouldn't be able to recognize them amongst any of us. But in all reality, they should be in jail. Folks, you can put on a mask, but God sees your heart, and he's going to let everybody else see it too. You know, most pastors, the longer you're, I don't want to call it a business, but you know, when we're surrounded by pastors on a district, most pastors are fantastic and they're trying to serve the Lord and bring people into the kingdom. But then there's also some of them that when you get to know them, you realize they're building their own little kingdom. You know what I mean? Lord, help us. Jesus said in Mark chapter 7, he taught that you will know them by their fruits. That what comes out of a man comes from the heart. In Mark chapter 6, 7, verse 6, he says, He told them, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship, their worship of me is worthless because they teach rules as human doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God to hold to human tradition. Then he told them, you have such a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to keep your own tradition. And then skipping down to verse 14. Then he called to the crowd again and he told them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. Nothing that goes into a person from the outside can make them, him unclean. It's what comes out of the person that makes a person unclean. If anyone has ears to hear, let him listen. When he had left the crowd and gone home, his disciples began asking him about the parable. Jesus, in his kind demeanor, answers them in verse 18 and says, Are you ignorant? <laughs> Don't you know that nothing that goes into a person from the outside can make him unclean? Because it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach and then into the sewer, thereby expelling all foods. Then he continued, it's what comes out of a person that makes a person unclean. Because it's from within, from the human heart, that evil thoughts come. As well as sexual immorality, stealing, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, cheating, shameless lust, envy, slander, arrogance, and foolishness. All of these things come from inside and make a person unclean. People can put on a mask. God doesn't care about your mask because he's got x-ray vision. Sometimes he gives us the ability to have x-ray vision too and we can see what's going on behind closed doors. Folks, we need to be real careful who we're putting as important in our lives. we got to be understanding that God's not going to use those or we shouldn't be using those whose heart are not right with him. This last week was pretty successful, I'll be honest. The Lord really used me. But it wasn't because it was me preaching. I don't have any special abilities. I don't have any tr special training. I'm a simple country preacher. It wasn't because of the presenter. It wasn't even because of the presentation. I didn't... None of the sermons that I preached this last week, out of all eight of them... None of them were deep and theological. None of them were. They were simple. In fact, I went through on multiple occasions, and when I was trying to describe a word, all I did was I right-clicked, and it went down to where it says synonyms, and I just copied and pasted all of them. It wasn't smart or genius. Any one of us in here could do it. It wasn't the presentation. What made last week successful... And people's lives changed and altars filled. Was that when they came, they came with hungry hearts for whatever God had for them. They were hungry. You know what? When you come hungry, you leave full because you've been eaten. If you don't come in hungry, you're not going to leave full because you haven't been chewing on nothing. 
I was in one of those services this week, and this shows you how hungry they were. I was getting to my conclusion. I had about a fourth of my sermon left. I had a long extended conclusion that was application to, to draw them to the altar. And I get almost to, I'm like one slide away from my conclusion application section. And there's people in the pews and they're literally sobbing already. And I realize there is no point to do this application because they're already wanting to seek the, seek the Lord at the altar. So I got to the next slide and I ended it right there. I said, all right. And this was all my, my drawing was. I said, I feel like the Lord's moving. If you want to meet me down here at the altar and let's pray, let's do it. And by the time I said that, they were bumping into each other coming down to the altar. And I'm not talking about the kids that I somehow manipulated. These were adults that have been Christians longer than I've been alive. But they were hungry. If you come hungry, God will feed you. If you're just satisfied with where you're at, you've got all you're ever going to need. Or at least ever, whatever you're ever going to want. You may need a whole lot more, but you'll never get it. It was the heart of the people to want. They were hungry. And I was humble. I said, Lord, whatever you got for me, I'll give it to them. And man, the Lord switched those sermons around. I don't know how many times. I struggled for a month. And boy, you talk about conviction. You're trying to give something to give somebody else. And you've got a month to prepare. And every time you get there, the Lord says, well, Dan, you're going to preach this. How are you living it? Well, Dan, you're going to preach this. How are you going to live it? <laughs> a month is a long time to have conviction. <laughs> you got to deal with that quick. Otherwise, you're miserable. It wasn't about Dan. I kept pulling them back to say, listen, you need to pray to the only one that can answer the prayers of your heart, the needs that you have. Go to him. He's the only one that's got the answer. He is the one that's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. It's him. And God used that for them, but he can use it for us too. The problem is, all too often we're like Saul and our heart's not where it needs to be. We're satisfied with where we're at spiritually and Lord, don't we don't need any more. We're not willing to make any sacrifices to get any more. Lord, help us. Lord, help us. <clears throat> Those that made the greatest impact in my life externally were those who had the love of God in their hearts internally. The reason I had you all get those little mints, well, we took the kids down to the Apple Festival down at Liberty yesterday. And they had an Amish store down there. The one, the Amish store that's in Berea closed. And so I love those places. They've got real cheap spices and all different ones. And while I was there, I looked down and I saw those little pink lozenges that taste like Pepto-Bismol. <laughs> and it brought me back to a man that I knew as a kid. He was 100 years old when I was about, I think I was seven. And he was a very, he was actually a very wealthy man, but you'd never know it. Um, he wore old suits and came from the school. You know, you didn't have food or drink in the sanctuary. You, you know, it was God's house and you're, you're very particular. Well, but he had his own little exception to that rule. And it was those little candies. He had the pink ones or the white ones on any given Sunday. And despite his own proclivities to the holiness inside the sanctuary, he had always had a pocket full in his suit coat. And us little kids <laughs> knew that Mr. Percy Hall had those candies and he was all more than ready to give them to us. And so we'd go and snuggle up to him next to the pew. And he'd get a little mischievous smirk on his face and he'd reach down in his pocket and he'd pull it out and he'd hand it in our hands, you know. That man, his eyes got so bad they took away his driver's license. But he was not going to let that slow him down because he had people to bring to church. So he went and bought a four-wheeler. <laughs> he did. He went and bought a four-wheeler and he would go around our backwoods neighborhood. I mean, we were further out in the country than here. 
And he would drive down those Michigan dirt roads and pick up kids for Sunday school on his four-wheeler. <laughs> it's a different time, you know? <laughs> I don't think they'd be allowed to do that now. He was a man of God. And he made a dramatic impact in my life. Just as a little kid. Because not what was on the external, but was what was internally was filled with the love of Jesus. I mentioned her name, my revival, but there was another lady. Her name was Elizabeth Briggs. She was about 10 years younger than Percy was, and she attended our church. And everybody around Elizabeth knew that she loved Jesus and that Jesus loved them. She wasn't much she could do in her elderly years, and so she would crochet pillows. And you would go into her house, and there would be crocheted pillows everywhere. And every time you walked in, because she had a bad memory, she would say, now, did I give you a pillow? I don't know how many times as a child, and I didn't even like the crocheted pillows. They're not comfortable to put your head on, you know? I don't know how many times as a kid she asked me if I had one of her pillows. Every time she'd give out a pillow, she'd give out the story of Jesus. She'd let you know that Jesus loved you. And that while she was crocheting that pillow, she was praying for whoever was going to receive it. She exuded, just oozed the love of Jesus from her heart. <clears throat> there are people in heaven today because Percy Hall and Elizabeth Briggs loved God genuinely from the inside out. When I was there at Mount Carmel, I came to serve the Lord. That was my goal. That was the reason I went. But I was a kid with lots of anger issues, real bad temper. I was a kid that had a lot of baggage. My second year there, it was just a it was one of those bad days. And I got in trouble and I turned around and I put a hole through the wall. I'd been trying to serve the Lord. The Lord had done a lot in my life. But one of the things he still had to work on, and he still does at times, is work on my anger issues. <laughs> work on my explosive anger. And I couldn't forgive myself for months. And the former principal, he'd since retired... He was over our, our uh, study hall. And there wasn't just but, but a few of us in there in the library doing studies. And he had Parkinson's. He shook real bad by the time I knew him. And he came up. He sat down on the desk. He's just shaking. And he came down real close so I could hear him and he wouldn't embarrass me. And he said, Dan... That's not the first hole in these walls. And it's not going to be the last. You can forgive yourself. And that was what I needed. That was exactly what I needed to be able to forgive myself and to move on from my failure. If he would have never said that, I don't know if I'd have ever been able to. But he had a genuine love for me and he showed it. He lived it out. Within, I'm pretty sure, because it was fall revival, that, and by Thanksgiving, he passed over and died. It was real suddenly. He was at visiting family, and he was getting dressed up in the upper bedroom, and he was gone. What happens if he'd have been silent? Where would I be at today? His heart was right with God. His heart was lived out in his life. He wasn't putting on a mask. He was genuine. And God used him. The people that made the most impact in me were those that had it internally. So I say this in closing. What does your heart x-ray say? When the doctor's looking at it, are there abnormal abnormalities, if I could even say what I wrote down? Are you operating under carnal ambitions? 
Do you have pride in your heart that says I'm all that? Or a pride in your heart that says I won't lower myself to that level? Is there selfishness there? Is there indifference or apathy? Is there an unwilling heart, a distracted heart? A heart of lack of faith? A heart of judgmentality? That nobody's as good as you are? This morning, God can do surgery. He can do the laser surgery. (laughs) The one that doesn't have to crack you open and rip you apart. He can just go in there and deal with the problem and fix it. Would you stand with me this morning? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. It really does mean the world to me that you're getting a blessing out of it. If this video was a blessing, make sure to hit that thumbs up button for me. That way other people can find it as well. Here in the link section, you'll find playlists and new videos that we put out. We try to do two or three a week. You can also subscribe to the channel uh, by pressing on my face and then hitting the bell icon and that will alert you to new videos. May God richly bless you.